it's always my pleasure to introduce Orietta Darol, who is a university lecturer at the University of Cambridge and a fellow of St. John's College. She has published on medieval manuscript culture and scribes, focusing chiefly on the period 1100 to 1500, and researches the codicology and paleography of medieval manuscripts. She is currently working on a book on the significance of paper in the later medieval period in England. So, take Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, first of all, I would like to thank Stuart for inviting me to give a paper about paper. He wanted watermarks instead he, he gets handwriting. So, sorry about that. Um, I here return to a theme I touched upon a few years ago with the intent of clarifying some of my current ideas on the use of paper in writing English vernacular books. But in particular, I'd like to think in more detail about how we judge the hands of those scribes who write on paper in England in the late medieval period. Um, as Keith mentioned, this is based on chapter four of my book, and this is very preliminary research, so any suggestions is very gratefully received. So at the end of one of the last battles between Mordred and King Arthur, Arthur sees his nephew Gawain lying on the ground. He runs to him and tries to help him out. But Gawain knows that his time has also come to an end and confesses all his wrongdoing to Arthur. He says, I pray you, hence my title, that I may have paper, pen and ink, that I may write to Sir Lancelot a letter. Gawain wants to write to Lancelot to ask for his forgiveness. There is quite a lot of information in this sentence regarding writing in the late medieval period. Paper is the material of choice for writing letters, which is to be expected, but also it seems that pen and ink were readily available as portable objects in the royal chancery, even fictitious as the one we have here, even during war. But what is not telling us is what script Gawain might use. Might it be a form of Anglicana, or secretary script, or something in between? Obviously, uh, Mallory is the end of the 15th century. It is also implied that a knight ought to be able to write, probably a similarity to Mallory's own practices. But how would his hand look like on paper? Of course, this is fiction, but as I hope to show, not irrelevant for the following discussion. I have already noted that scholars of the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries consider paper manuscripts as poor relations to parchment productions. Second class manuscripts written by non-professional or amateur used mainly at universities and for pragmatic texts. I have also argued that this approach overshadows the greater possibility that a systematic study of the field demands. However, term such as amateur and professional still dominate our vocabulary when we describe those hands we find in late medieval vernacular books. I have argued that these labels are unhelpful and building on Petrucci's work, I suggested that using terms such as proficiency of script may be a better way forward. Indeed, those individuals who use paper show a varied level of proficiency in the writing skills they display and different training in the overall production of the manuscript they copy. And in this slide, you can see a number of examples of what I mean. It would be nice to have a little fun game so that you can tell me what you think is a professional, what you think is an amateur. But I shall not do that because I think it's a bit unfair, although I do do to my students. Okay, so all these handwritings belong to known late medieval people writing in England in different capacities and in different professions. They are very small sample taken from the Mapping Paper Project, a database of paper manuscript which is currently being compiled thanks to a grant from the School of Arts and Humanities at Cambridge University. These are all writers who seem to have been taught how to write in different ways, probably, and I wonder how they were trained, and I'll come back to this later. So just to give you a little bit of um, ideas about this number. number. So the number one, sorry, is a bit, it's a bit out of focus, um, is HM114. Uh, it contains various texts, including Chaucer, Troilus and Crusader, and Piers Plowman, and the hand is Richard Osborne, chamber clerk at the Guildhall London, uh, working 1400 to 1437. Um, this is an informal, what I call informal Anglicano formata, but it's still professional. Number two 
is Oxford Lincoln College LAT 129. I'll, I'll give you all this detail later, so don't worry about that. Uh, and it, con uh, it contains grammatical text. And this person is Thomas Short, Newgate School, Bristol, 1424. Uh, Miss uh, Mix Secretary in Anglicana style, amateur. Number three, uh, Paris National, uh, font Latin 3436, uh, contains Latin text. The scribe here is John Duxworth, who copied other manuscripts. Uh, secretary Hen, and he was the secretary of Jean d'Aguilene when he was in captivity here in London. Um, it has been argued that this is a clear but not elegant book hand from the 15th century secretary. Some problems with this definition, but let's move over. Number four, uh, CULKK 1.6. Um, it uh, contains Eleanor's, Eleanor Hull's translation of the Seven Psalms um, with other meditative material. Probably written before 1456 by Richard Fox. Richard Fox, um, St. Alban's procurator, procurator, according to the records, so the proctor and steward. Again, unfortunately, um, considered an amateur. Number five, we are getting later and later. This is William Paston, uh, 1458, lawyer to his brother, John Paston I. And number six, Stono letter, Sir, Sir William Stono merchant, uh, 1482. And here you have a summary of all what I told you. In this selection, I wanted to show how complicated it is to distinguish between amateur and professional, mainly because I fear. Don't reboot? Thank you. Okay. Uh, in this, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to reboot, I'm just starting from where I am. In this section, I wanted to show how complicated it is to distinguish between amateur and professional, mainly because I fear that these labels have been used without a clear understanding of what their use may imply. What distinguishes an am a professional scribe from an amateur is not always clear, and scholars have tried to explain their understanding in different ways. And it's very refreshing sometimes to go back to all scholarship. Um, because there's a lot of wisdom in that scholarship and you know to understand how we come to what we describe now. So Jenkinson distinguished between clerks, public scriveners, notaries and letter laymen and this distinction is based upon the type of training and education they had. Bueller, who is the most influential one for these uh, labels, recognized that anyone who could write could potentially produce manuscripts, and he divided these people into three groups, professional, amateur, and semi-professional. The first includes those scribes that are copying for the public and produce very fine manuscripts. The second includes those that are not professional scribes, but were copying for uh, themselves or for others. I suppose Thomas Short could be the example here. University students, make up the third category. Among the professional scribes, Bueller also includes writer, writers who earn their living by their work through employment in court, government office, and as public clerk. Osborne probably comes to mind here. Later on, Christensen has focused his research on the London book trade, and he talks about how the lady was involved in uh, um, book production. Uh, and in particular, he talks about literati. And in this case, probably Richard Fox um, can be uh, put in this category because we know from the St. Alban's record that he's being labeled as a literatus. This way of thinking about scribal activities can be helpful, but is somehow reductive. The figure of secretary, the, equil the equivalent of our modern PA, for instance, is not considered. So where do we put Duxworth in this classification? Can write elegantly. Well, I actually thought he could write pretty well. Furthermore, the recent work that Lynn Mooney and Estelle Stubb have published regarding the interplay between professions and the relationship of those professions with the copying and circulation of books in London makes us wonder where the boundaries lie. Richard Osborne is a case in point. He, work, he worked as a chamber clerk at the Guildhall in London from 1400 to 37, and is now 
a famous scribe who copied, among other things, uh, Chaucer, Troilus, and Criseide. Um, also in another manuscript here, hardly 3943, but also copied um, another manuscript that we know of, not of the same text, London, London, 491. Quite rightly, I think, Dan Wakelin asks, quote, how professional was his second single-handed copy of <coughs> Troilus and Criseide? By that, he means the one at the top there, HN114. This copy is fairly current, is in fairly current writing, is a, in a casual layout and largely on paper. It contrasts with the set aspect of his handwriting in the collaborative copy, this one, which is in a neater symmetrical layout of five stanza per page and on parchment with more decoration. Shouldn't here Talk, uh, shouldn't we here talk about level of formality? So these hands there and the last page of uh, San Marino HM 114 is still an Anglicana formata, it's less formal than this one and also less formal than the one at the beginning of the book over there. Or perhaps greater script, earlier uh, scholars um, uh, in the earlier period, do talk about grade of scripts, or this distinction does not apply to late medieval handwriting. I also would like you to note how the material is taken into consideration when we also make this judgment, we have it go together. Another case is Richard Fox, KK16, who is referred in the literature as a chronicler and an amateur scribe. But he seems to have been a compiler of books, for in his will, he bequeathed a book that is in 25 choirs, four more part written. And here you can see, this is the first part of the manuscript. Um, we think that this was the same, this was Richard Fox. This is the, the second part of the manuscript. Here you have written an explicit quote, Richard Fox. Um, I'm actually thinking that probably it's the same hand, but just less formal, but don't quote me on that, I'm not so sure. We certainly was the one who compiled the book and put the book together and put in all the red, um, and all the red ink. This is, I think, the core of the problem. When we talk about professional and amateur scribe, are we talking about their training, their handwriting, or are we describing the type of work that the copist is producing? And if the latter, can we collectively find a better way of thinking about how we describe what we see? This is a pressing and urgent discussion for late medieval English book production, and particularly so for paper manuscripts. As you can see, I do have um, a reason for, for uh, pushing this argument. As I said before, paper does not lend itself to being understood as a prestigious material, and therefore everything written on it, we should just burn it. But actually, can we find a way of thinking about it differently? We have recently concurred that paper was used by clerks at the service of the increasing need of, late medieval, of the late medieval bureaucratic machine. But can we build on these suggestions a bit more, thinking about questions such as who were these clerks? How did they write? How did they learn how to write? Can a clerk be a professional and at the same time an amateur? I'm here thinking whether we can posit that there is more to the relationship between paper and medieval society than one has been previously um, thought. For example, what about the mercantile class whose members seem to be quite taken by paper and other professions such as lawyers and schoolmasters? Where do they fit into our understanding of those individuals who wrote on paper and how can we talk about their handwriting when we don't know who they are? Because that's also a key element that there is so much anonymity in late medieval book market that we sometimes apply labels without actually really realizing those labels are as fictitious maybe as the story we are trying to tell. Petrucci discussed the importance of debating proficiency of scripts, but now building on this material and reading current research in medieval handwriting in other European countries, I'm wondering whether we can propose a slightly different angle to provide some useful insights to readjust taxonomies and rebalance considerations. All 
these hands are cursive hands, some less current than others, but they all belong to what Kerr, in his wonderful introduction to medieval manuscripts in British Library, initially defined as Anglicana and secretary scripts. There, I think, for the first time, he took on the task of thinking about cursive hands in English manuscript production, a concept which has now been systematically explained by Parks in his majestic English cursive book hand. In his book, Parks argues that cursive scripts are born out of a need to produce books more quickly as a consequence to the expansion of literacy. A theme that De Rolle further expounds in his uh, The Paleography of Gothic Manuscripts and to which Parks returns in his Their Hands Before Our Eye. Here, yeah, just a, a very short quotation from there. He, um, Park says, cursive handwriting is a way of writing rather than a particular style of tradition of script, and is not confined to any period. New letters appeared first as variants in the handwriting of individuals, but over a period of time, as other scribes adopted these cursive forms, and as readers became more accustomed to the new shapes, these configurations were incorporated into the bas basic ductus of contemporary cursive handwriting. This introduces a couple of critical elements to our discussion. Number one, the importance of the readers in the development of cursive script. Number two, the existence of a basic du ductus which could be modified. A possible implication for these considerations um, is the need to develop general as well as specialized training in profession. Parks talks about university scribes, but for example, do British merchants learn to write accounts in their own hand? And if so, what type of script are they taught? Are they taught Anglicana, Anglicana Formata, Basar Anglicana or Secretary? Or are they taught something in between? And what the, in, within all of these scripts, what is the role of the basic? Ductus. Recent scholarship by Petrucci, Casamassima Ceccherini, just to mention a few, uh, on Italian cursive hands, showed that business demands let merchants' family to send their children to school to learn a specific type of script. Oh, sorry. Um, the Mercantesca, a cursive script uh, different from the Cancelleresca, the Chancery script reserved to notaries. A classic example here, this is the exercise book of Francesco di Marco Dattini, a born 1335, and this is his exercise book. And you can see here how the cursive element of the script is taught by repetition of a model, e prima e poi ribattere il convegno due serpenti, etc., etc. In Brittle, we have not yet had a discussion about the role, for example, of the mercantile community in the development of cursive script, or in fact, of any sort of community develop the cursive script. But what I found, and in fact it's also very difficult to find any sort of um, evidence, like <laughs> the one for the Datini, when we think about how um, late medieval handwriting was taught. So this is the closest I found in Oxford Lincoln College Manuscript Lab 130. Um, and the, thorn, the, the, the Stonos papers, sorry, this went out of sequence, um, are, are relevant here as well. Um, you know, what sort of hand did these merchants write? To me, it's a sort of hybrid, but it would be really interesting to think a little bit more about that. Uh, and, and the same it could also apply to the handwriting of lawyers. These questions, lead to wider issues on the teaching and use of the cursive ductus in specialist scripts, and to ponder what is the relationship between paper and cursivity, if any. Indeed, it may be possible that a demand for quick writing may also require more material to write on, but this is another paper. So, to conclude, in our current discussions on the way in which we think about late medieval scribal culture, we have focused our attention on the identification of scribes. Indeed, a very necessary exercise because in Britain, so many of the individuals who copied books still remain without a name. But I think now we need to move forward, working from the foundational work done by Kerr, Parks and others, to discuss how cursive scripts 
were taught across professions. And I know that here we have um, a new project that is particularly looking at curs cursiveness in English books. And I think this is really important. I'm really looking forward to reading the results of that project. This um, may allow us to nuance our approach on the taxonomies of late medieval copy standard books. And falling from this, we also ought to realize that there is a difference between paper and parchment manuscript. That's fine. We all know that. But that difference is not between amateur or professional. But more thinking needs to be done on this type of nomenclatures and on decisions behind book productions in general. Perhaps we can collectively start thinking about how function and proficiency of script may help to adopt a different type of descriptive language, or at least to be clear about what we mean when we use labels such as amateur and professional, so that we can contribute to a wider discussion on the race of cursivity as an European phenomenon, and also as a way in which the ability to read and the ability to write became what we understood today as literacy. Thank you. Merchants, I think, has got has something to do with that because I would use merchants all the time. Um, uh, then, of course, you know, the bureaucrats work, you know, people had to write paper, but really my work on paper has actually uncovered that writing is only one element of this big paper commodity thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the paper was really part of medieval culture and the appropriation went through, you know, as every technology needs to go through some sort of appropriation and it happened outside the writing room mm. as well as in the writing room. I mean, parchment has still got a very important role in England because paper didn't arrive here until the 14th century. So, you know, I'm not here arguing that, you know, let's ditch parchment. No, at all. But I think, I think we need to think a little bit more carefully. So profession, yeah, merchants, I would like to know more about lawyers, I would like to know more about uh, they use in their household, you know, the secretary, the role of the secretaries. I think they were also foundational for. So there may have been some initiative on the part of, say, secretaries in choosing one material rather than. Yeah, I mean, you have to think it's more convenient, you know, if for the same money you can, <laughs> you can buy three rolls of parchment or you can buy a ram of paper. How many sheets have you got in there? You know, it's also a question of convenience. You know, there are a lot of things that cause in the choice of the material <coughs> to, to, to write from. And again, you know, this idea of the readers that um, within the book market there is a, a number of elements that can influence the choice of material. It's not just dictated by one, it's not one-sided only. So that's the sort of thing I'm trying to investigate and trying to understand a little bit more about. Um, uh, is the convenience as I have it there, but do I also look for it? And if I look for it, why do I look for it? Loretta? Yes. The thing I understood you were right, you said that the scribe could be both amateur and professional maybe at the same time. Mm. So were you distinguishing between document types and saying so, you know, they might be familiar in mm. one type of format, but if they write something else, they don't have the demands of that mm. document type would require, say, legal or. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I was, I was, I mean, what I'm trying to do here, I would just would like to ditch these two labels. I just would like us to stop using it. And I would like us to, um, you know, I know that Kerr used good hand, bad hand, and that's also perhaps is not ideal either. Yours but ugly hand. Ugly right? hand, yeah, rough. Masterly hand, vigorous yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 see, but what, what I mean is like, <laughs> that we moved from thinking about the hand into thinking about the possible profession of that person, of what the person was. And I'm just thinking, can we just remove that for a minute and think about what we have in front of us right. and how we talk about what we have in front of us. Uh, and then if we need to describe 
For example, the Mercantesca, okay? That's a style, we can talk about the Mercantesca. We know we have Bibles written on, on paper in Italy in a Mercantesca style. That was because the merchants wanted the Mercantesca on the Bible because they could read it. Give them the Cancelleresca, they might not have been able to read it. So, so you see, I, I, that, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not sure where I'm going with all of this. So sorry, I haven't answered your that question. I haven't completely answered and you're going to a good place. Yeah, we'll see. Julia. Um, have you thrown, have you thought about throwing the conditions of abbreviation? No, I haven't done that those yet. Are systems of, you know, that kind of mm. encoding of yeah, writing, yeah, yeah. which requires specialised training to yeah. encode and to decode, and therefore cursivity isn't just a kind of modus operandi. Yeah, yeah. It actually requires specialists, unless it's just a kind of slipping of the ductus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, there may be sort of other mechanisms at work which fix the groups in, in different kinds of ways. Oh, no, I think about having, as I said, this is all preliminary, so yeah, that's a very good point because you need to know how to do it. But then, uh, yeah, and as to read it as well. And you well. see, that's really important as well uh, because if whoever you make the book for cannot read it, then. So we have time for one more question. Yeah, thank you. Very, very, very interesting. Both focus on the, the writing and the hands. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you about the paper. OK. You're not <laughs> writing paper and ink. OK. And the skip the ink, that's too complicated. Yeah. Um, but I was introduced to a small project up at the Petri at UCL where we were looking at the construction of the papyrus. Yeah. And whether it was different for the legal documents and the more sort of uh, mm -hmm. military documents. Are you finding any difference in the quality of the paper for the different things that are written on it? Mm. In the sense that if this is something that's come from a scribal tradition, is it better quality paper than the household paper? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I think. Not something you've looked at. No, well. Okay, <laughs> so it requires, you know, there is a full chapter on this, but I'll, 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 I'll explain, try to explain very briefly. Okay, in the documents, you know, in the accounts, we do have um, records of buying different types of papers, okay? So, but the, the writing paper is usually named either, uh, either paper for writing or royal paper. So they give you the size of the paper, that's the best paper. We do have paper for wrapping jam, paper for wrapping spices, Paper, you know, so there are different qualities of paper, so we know there are different qualities of papers around Europe. So that's something we know. Looking through the, the actual spectrum between the beginning of the um, 1400, uh, 14th century down to 1475, because I stop with the printing, I don't want to do anything with printing, or things get too complicated, you can see that the quality of paper changes. A writing paper is, is always good paper. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see that the thinness of the laid line um, become um, smaller as you progress because I mean, there's a lot of th there is a reason for that. So quality becomes it's good. But the King Lin's register uh, with records from 1304 has the paper which is so good that actually, you know, is wonderful. And it's at the same level of quality as the Mallory's manuscript, which we know is at the end of the 15th century. So paper can be frail sometimes, like for example, the Finden manuscript at the UL. Because the paper has been handled probably a little bit more than some of the other manuscripts I've seen, then you can see that it is a little bit more frail. But I think the quality-wise, they, they, they could produce pretty wonderful paper. What people didn't do very well with was with wrapping, uh, couldn't survive very well the wrapping of salami, for example. <laughs> they loved uh, uh, chopping up paper manuscripts to wrap salami in Milan as well as here in England. There was a, an instance of the Pro Polychronicon that was rescued from a butcher uh, uh, shop and fire, of course. Again, I haven't answered your question precisely, but this is just. No, there you have. The, the Yeah, but yeah, yeah. The writing, uh, and we don't always find um, there is not all accounts of uh, so wonderful uh, descriptive of paper. 
That is, um, when the King of France was here in captivity, Jean, the French secretary were wonderful at actually giving me all these details about paper. British secretaries were not so good, they would just write paper. So I think probably French could do, could, could do a little bit better for my work than, than, than yeah, actually. Yeah, but. Is yeah. there interest in the writing? No, what he was doing was compiling the, the household of the King of France. He would just go through every single item of what the King of France was buying. And uh, yeah, he was, he, he was great. He gave me all sorts of information about paper. And I haven't found so much actually going through many other accounts. But I've got a long list of accounts to go through, so I might have more to say about that. Okay, so I think we have to move things along. But um, yeah, thank you very much. That's great.